Let's look at verse number one. The Bible says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So this is interesting just from the start that a Pharisee uh, is coming to Jesus. It says in verse two, the same came to Jesus by night, meaning Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art, art, thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So we're going to go back and, and look at verse number two um, in just a few minutes. But this, just to say this, not all the Pharisees were these reprobates that could not believe. Okay, so Nicodemus is a perfect example of this. But it is important to note in verse number two right away that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Okay, because this, this term right here, or this, this characteristic of Nicodemus, sort of defines his whole life as we see it in the Bible. He was embarrassed, he was ashamed um, to even be considering going to talk to Jesus. So he had some questions. And, you know, it's interesting, and we're going to go to John chapter 12 and study this, but it's interesting because, you know, many people have the question of how could Jesus have been doing all these miracles and some people didn't believe in him. And we'll look at that in John chapter 12. But we see in verse number two that many people did believe in him because of those miracles. And that is exactly what Nicodemus says. He says, no man could do these miracles. You know, it's very clear that he's healing people. He's raising people from the dead. You know, he's like, it must be, it must be of God. You know, God must be with this person. So Jesus Nicodemus comes to Jesus in secret, in private, to ask him questions. And look at verse number three. Jesus now answers um, Nicodemus. So Nicodemus basically says, how could you be doing these things unless God is with you? You know, so Nicodemus is kind of opening himself up to Jesus saying, look, I, I want to believe you. I, I tend to believe you. Um, but, you know, how, tell me what this is all about. And look what Jesus says. In verse number three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So now Jesus goes into this idea right away of being born again. So let's look at this because much confusion is often um, it, and, and much false doctrine is brought out of these next few verses. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, you know, you must be born again to go to heaven, basically. And look at verse number four. Nicodemus is confused right away. He's confused. He says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus right away is confused. I mean, and look, you can understand that. If you'd never heard the idea or the, the phrase, you must be born again, you know, we've probably heard that so many times in our lives that it just, we know it means salvation. We know it means trusting on Jesus. But Jesus is now going to explain it um, to Nicodemus. But right away, he's like, how can you be born twice? It's like, can a man go back inside his mother and be born again, you know, as, you know, when he's old? Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now let me just put some emphasis. Let me read that again for you that maybe help you understand it a little bit better right off the bat. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Right away, Jesus here is explaining what he said. He's saying, you need to be born twice. He's like, the first time is of water, and the second time is of the Spirit. So make sure that you do a counting in your mind about how many times you're born here in John chapter 3. There's two births that Jesus is talking about. You're born once, as we all have been born, and then you're born again. And Jesus describes it in John chapter 3, verse number 5 as the water and the spirit, okay? But now look at verse number six. Now it could be confusing if that was the end of it, all right? And I could see where people could get this false doctrine, but many people take what Jesus said here saying as, as evidence that you need to be baptized to be saved. And I'm gonna explain that, right? Well, Jesus explains it in the very next verse. So he says in verse number five, he says you must be born of water and of the spirit. Now he says it again in verse number six, look what he says. He says, that which is born of the flesh 
is flesh. There's the first birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we're talking about the water and spirit in verse number five. And then he defines that again. He uses a synonym for the water birth as the flesh birth. So what he's talking about in verse number five is not baptism. What he's talking about in verse number five is being physically born. That's the water birth that he's talking about is being physically born. I mean, a child is in water. It's in the, the, you know, the mother's water breaks, you know, right before the child is born. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about the two births is the physical, actual birth and being born again spiritually, getting saved. Okay, look at verse number seven. He says, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Go back to John chapter one. Go back to John chapter one, just a couple of chapters back in your Bible. And let's look at this idea of being born again um, spiritually here. Born again spiritually. Look at John chapter one and verse number 12. What, happened, what happens to us, the Bible says in many places, after we get saved? We become adopted into God's family. We become children of God. We become, God becomes our heavenly father. Look at verse number 12 of John chapter one. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the what? The lowercase s, sons of God, even to them. Now, what does receive him mean? Now, he defines it again, even to them that what? Believe on his name. So people that have trusted on Jesus, people that have gotten saved, you know, they become sons of God. They become adopted into God's family. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Just talking about this idea that we are born again spiritually when we are saved. Now, what's really silly is that people could take what Jesus says here and take it to believe that you must be baptized to be saved. Because if you take that verse 5 and say that that water and the spirit, that the water is baptism, like so many things don't make sense at that point. You think about the water being baptism. Number one, remember we're doing an accounting on how many times we're born here. So Jesus is saying you're physically born, that's one time, and then you're born of the Spirit, that's two times. You're born again, okay? This is another reason, by the way, that you have to reject the idea that you could lose your salvation. Because there is nothing in the Bible that ever says that you're born again, and then again, and then again, and then again. If you believed, if you would, I mean, it would be a more biblical position to, if you believe that you could lose your salvation, which is not biblical, but it would be a more biblical position, at least if you believe, okay, you lose your salvation, then you could never get it back again. Because then at least, you know, you're, you're born again and that's it, if you lose it. But you can't, I mean, so many things in the Bible would be, would be false if that is the case anyway. But the point is, you're born again one time, that's it. If water meant baptism, in verse number five, that would be one. The spirit would be two. And then you have the physical birth, which would be three. You literally need to be born three times if you look at this as being baptism. It's just, it's a stretch. And like so many, just remember our Bible reading rule. A Bible reading rule that you must have is if, if you read something in the Bible that con and you read into it and you interpret it in a way that contradicts other clear verses in the Bible, you must be interpreting it wrong. Just keep that in mind, because the Bible must, must be consistent with itself. Turn to Acts chapter two and verse 38. So the, the baptism to be saved people, Acts 2.38 is like their go-to verse right here in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter two and verse number 38. Acts chapter two and verse number, you gotta be baptized to be saved. Acts 2.38, heard it a million times out there. People will tell you, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38, they don't even know what Acts 2.38 even says. But look at verse uh, 38 of Acts chapter 2. And then, you know, put a, put a finger in Acts chapter 16. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and then we're going to go to Acts chapter 16. Remember our Bible reading rule. The Bible must be consistent with itself. If you're interpreting a verse in the Bible that contradicts another clear verse in the Bible, I mean, I'm talking about a clear verse in the Bible. And the most clear verses in the Bible are the verses on salvation. The most simple thing in the Bible is that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is all that is required for salvation. Look at Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, 
and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Does that say that if you're, you must be baptized to be saved? That is not what that says. Peter is just telling them, look, Acts 2.38 is simply pointing out the importance of baptism. And all these verses in the Bible of people getting saved and then getting baptized right away, look, this just shows us how important baptism is to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it shows. Go to Acts 16 and verse number 30. So let's say that we read Acts 2.38 to mean that you must be baptized to receive the remission of sins. Look at verse um, Acts 16, look at verse number 30. The, a very simple question is asked in the Bible by this Philippian jailer. He asked the two disciples that are in prison, he said he brought them out and said, Sirs, I mean, this is a very direct, simple question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's saying, how do I go to heaven? How can I be saved from condemnation? And look what they say to him. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Where's baptism there? They literally just told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that you must do. I mean, did they lie to this guy? Is verse number 31 not true? If you have to be baptized to be saved, verse number 31 in the Bible of Acts chapter 16 is not true. Because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not enough. You must also be baptized. Now, of course, what did they do when, they, when he did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? What did they do? They went and they baptized him in his house. But it just, again, it's just showing the importance of baptism to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not a requirement for salvation. Or all these verses, these simple, clear verses in the Bible that say just believing is, they're not true. So we must take into, you know, we must, you must, like, read the Bible, and it must be consistent with other clear verses, or you are, you are interpret, you're interpreting something wrong. Go back to John chapter 3. So, he's talking about being born of water, which is equated in the very next verse, by the way. That's another thing. Most false doctrine, most people, you know, most people teaching false doctrines in the Bible, if you just read a couple verses before, and a couple verses after whatever verse they're using to, you know, quote unquote, prove their false doctrine, you will very clearly see, you know, why it is false. And it's, it's literally the next verse where Jesus equates the water with being born of the flesh. So we're looking at two births here, folks, the physical birth and then the spiritual birth. Okay, now look at verse number eight. So the guy's not getting it. Okay, the guy's not understanding. He's not getting... Um, he's not understanding what Jesus is saying um, to him. And so Jesus uh, continues. The Bible says, or Jesus says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He's, he's kind of saying here, he's, he's saying like, just, you know, you just got to, you just know it's there. When somebody's born of the Spirit, you know, you just, you just see that result that they're saved. He's like, you know, he's like, you don't necessarily have to understand where it's coming and where it's going. He, he you know, he uh, compares it to wind. You know, we see the wind blowing in a tree. We see that, but we don't know where the wind came, that, that part of the wind came from, or we don't know where that wind ends up. I mean, we don't know that. We just see the result of that wind that's in front of us. And you're like, man, Jesus, you're not making it any, any easier for this guy to understand. <laughs> but, you know, in Acts chapter 2, you know, when it talks about them being you know, um, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, the, the, the spirit in that verse, I think is verse number three, is compared to as a wind. You know, the spirit came as a wind. Jesus is kind of using that same analogy here. Nicodemus, look at verse number nine. Nicodemus, he's just, he's just still confused. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? He just, I don't understand what you're talking about, is what he says. And Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? So Jesus is saying, he's kind of pointing out, and I'm going to point out to you a little bit later um, in the sermon, how these masters of Israel, these Pharisees, that, I mean, this just goes to show you, be very weary in your life of self, you know, self-declared experts on things. 
Because he's saying, you guys are going around, you, you religious leaders, you're going around this nation and you're acting like you are these, these great sages, these experts on the Bible, these expert spiritual masters. And he's saying, you literally know nothing. He's like, you don't know anything about what's going on. And look at verse number 11. He says, verily, verily, this means truly, truly, I say unto thee, we speak that we do, that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. He's saying, me, the disciples, John the Baptist, we're going around and we're telling you experts. We're showing you these things through the miracles, through all these wonderful things. And he's like, and he's like, your people, you're not receiving. You're not receiving. What does he say that we have seen? And ye, he's talking about the plurality here of the Pharisees. He's like, your people, Nicodemus. He's like, you're seeing, you know, Nicodemus comes out in verse number two and he says, look at all the miracles. I see all these things. You know, it must be from God. He's like, but you know what? All your group of people, Jesus says, you're not receiving these miracles. You're not receiving the witness of what we're telling you. Look at verse 12. He said, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Verse 13. And no man hath ascended. Now he just starts, now he starts just like breaking it down for him, telling him who he really is. All right. He's going to get much more simple um, in the next few verses. Jesus is like, all right, I tested him to see if he could see. He just, I really gave him some deep spiritual thoughts, being born again, born of the spirit, you know, and he didn't get that. He's like, now I'm just going to break it down simply on what it takes to go to heaven. And this is why we use these coming verses out when we're out soul winning because what Jesus is about to say to Nicodemus is the most simple explanation of the gospel all right it's not using analogies it's not using you know these these great you know spiritual thoughts it's just here's how to do it here's how you get saved look at verse 13 he says and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven he's saying I am from heaven Nicodemus. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying, Nicodemus, I am God, is what he is saying. Look at verse 14. And now he predicts, now he tells Nicodemus about his death. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, this is a reference to Numbers chapter 21, where Moses made the bronze serpent to heal the people. It's a picture of Christ. It was a picture of the coming Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Speaking about his crucifixion, about his death that was going to happen. Look at verse 15. That what? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then verse 16, the most famous verse probably in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that means anybody, believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal everlasting life. And hopefully you use that verse out soul winning because it's one of the most powerful, one of the simplest verses in the entire Bible. Just again, verse 15, believeth in him, should not perish, eternal life. Believeth in him, verse 16. And then look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is a direct reflection of Romans 6, 23. All right, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Romans 6.23 is a direct reflection onto John 3.17. Look at verse 18. He that, I mean, yeah, I mean, you look at these, these verses. 1, 2, verse 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not, why is he condemned? I like how he, he says it in the positive, and then in the very next part of the verse, he always says the negative. Why is someone condemned? Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I don't know how many different ways Jesus could have said how to be saved in, in, these, in these verses. I mean, he basically said, you will not perish. He basically said, you're not condemned. He said, you're saved. He's like, you'll have eternal life. I mean, all 
all these different things. And then, you know, John the Baptist in John, in John 3, 36, you know, says another very clear verse. But we're only looking at Jesus' words. But Jesus just very simply breaks down the gospel for Nicodemus. He doesn't give any analogies on being born or spiritual analogies. He just breaks it down. He's like, believe on the Son. He's like, if you trust on me, he's like, you will be saved. You will have eternal life. You will not be condemned. Look at verse 19. And this, and he continues, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So now he's just explaining, he's explaining why men, so look, you're not saved, or you're not saved by your works, but he's saying, if He's saying these people that I came into the world and I started telling them the truth, but they were so wrapped up in evil works that they didn't believe me. It's like you, were, you could be so wrapped up in sin in your life. So you could knock on somebody's door. You're not saved by works by any means, but you could be so wrapped up in sin in your life and you have a heart that is just darkened towards the truth. You could just have no desire because maybe you're doing drugs, you're into this super worldly life, Whatever you're doing in your life you know is wrong, and somebody knocks on your door and at, you know, wants to preach the gospel to you, and you just have no interest. Why? Because your deeds are evil. So you're not, it, it's not your works that save you, but look, you're, the sin that you're in could mean that you're not going to seek the truth. could mean that you, know, you have no interest when the light actually comes to you. So, I mean, evil deeds have a direct impact on you know, whether or not somebody would want to hear the truth or not. All right, look at verse 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So Jesus here, Jesus here is just explaining, like, people that have, you know, that are trying to do the right thing, they will want the truth. Okay, it's, doing the right thing is not going to get them saved. But it will, it, the way that their heart has been kept, they will seek the truth, they will want the truth, when the truth or the light, as he says here, comes to them, they will receive it, and then they will get saved. How? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But people that are just, he's saying, he's explaining to Nicodemus why some people, why ye, he's saying, here's why ye, your group of people, are, are not receiving the light. It's because they're, they're into all this evil. That's basically what he's saying. He's explaining to them why certain people are seeing the miracles, and they're not believing, because they're into all this evil, and they don't want the light. Okay? Now, those are all the red words of John chapter 3. So let me ask you a question. Where does Jesus say baptism in John chapter 3? It's not there. It's all about believing on or not believing. That's all it is to be saved. Now, let's look at, let's go back to Nicodemus. So baptism for salvation is easily disproved from the Bible. That's not what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3. Otherwise, when he broke down the simple, you know, from verse 14 all the way to verse 19, when he just broke down the simple gospel for, or, I'm sorry, 14 to 21, he would have, you would think that he would have mentioned, like, a, one of the ways that, you, one of the things you need to do to get saved if baptism was in there. No, it was just believing, not believing, that's it, okay? Now, let's go back to Nicodemus. So, is he mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? That's the question. Turn to John chapter 19. Turn to John chapter 19. He is mentioned a couple of more times in the Bible. And let's look at those times in the Bible and see if we can get an idea. Uh, did he believe Jesus? First of all, was he saved? Okay, was Nicodemus saved? Look at John chapter 19. Because in John chapter 3, he was confused. Then G Jesus broke down, you know, the simple gospel for him. We don't really have an idea if he believed Jesus at that point. But look at verse uh, number 38 of John chapter 19. This is after um, the death of Jesus. Look at John chapter 19 and verse number 38. The Bible says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, again, look at this, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came, first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then they, this is uh, Joseph of Arimathea, this, this wealthy man, and Nicodemus, they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices 
as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man laid yet. There lay they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand, because it was, it was, it was close. Okay, so first of all, I, I, you know, I believe Nicodemus believed Jesus. I believe Nicodemus was saved. But here we have this secret disciple of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, and again, Nicodemus, they're kind of secretly going around, you know, kind of serving Jesus, you know, in secret. But turn to John chapter 12, we see another um, example of Nicodemus and, you know, some evidence that he was probably saved, that in John chapter 3, he probably did get saved and he probably did believe um, on Jesus, believe what Jesus was saying. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So he helped after Jesus' crucifixion with Joseph of Arimathea. But look at John chapter 12 before Jesus was crucified. He hath blinded, look at John chapter 12, look at verse number 40. So John chapter 12 and verse number 40 is explaining, you know, the prophecy in Isaiah that says that, you know, God will actually blind the eyes of certain people. He's going to make it so he's going to harden the hearts of certain people, blind the eyes of certain people, and this was many of the Pharisees, where Jesus, you know, basically said, I don't want them to believe. You know, it was a fulfilled prophecy. I don't want them to believe because they're just too wicked, they're too evil, you know, see Romans 1. They're too wicked, they're too evil, they've changed what God has said, they've turned on the Lord, they became haters of God, they're more you know, interested in lifting up themselves and just worshiping what they want to worship, and God's just been like, you know, you're done. You're done with these people. But, look at verse 40. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. This is God that has blinded the eyes and hardened the hearts of these people, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. God says there's certain people I don't want to heal. These things said Esaias, Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Now, verse number 42 is talking about Nicodemus and others like Nicodemus. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. So there were certain parts of the Pharisees that did believe. They weren't the majority. They weren't the majority, but there were some Pharisees that did believe, and Nicodemus is an individual example of one of these Pharisees that believed on Jesus. You say, so what did he do about it? Well, look at, verse, uh, look at the rest of the verse here. The Bible says, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. This is why, even in John chapter 19, when Joseph of Arimathea comes and Nicodemus comes, they're doing it in secret. Again, they're just, they're sneaking around, you know, they're being secret, secret disciples of Jesus, whatever, you know, whatever that means, being a secret disi disciple. Why would they do that, though? Why? Well, just look at verse 43. Why would they not just come out and, and say, we believe this man, we believe he's the Messiah? Why? It's very simple, and the Bible tells us, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's the answer right there. So this is Nicodemus' testimony. Yes, he got saved, but because he loved the praise of men more than he loved the praise of God, he stayed, as far as we know from the Bible, he stayed in secret about the whole thing. So the application, I mean, the application is, is a simple one for us as, as believers you know, we should not be one of these believers that doesn't want to be known in our lives. You know, Nicodemus, you think about him, he, he had a nice spot. I mean, he was a Pharisee. He was a ruler. You know, he was, you have to understand that they were under Roman rule. The Roman government was over them. But as far as the people, the Israelites, the Pharisees had control over the people. It was the religious leaders that had the control. I mean, he had, he had the praise of men. I'm sure he had a very comfortable life. I'm sure he had a comfortable living. And look, all that would have changed had he become known as a Christian, as somebody that believed Christ. Turn to John chapter 7, and let's look at the last point that I wanted, the last part that, I'm sorry, the last mention of Nicodemus that I want to point out. It's, it's the last mention of him in the Bible that we haven't looked at yet. But just remember, here's, 
Here's everything would have changed for Nicodemus had he have come out as, as, a, as a follower, as a believer of Jesus Christ. Remember, the Bible says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Say it the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The Bible teaches separation. The Bible teaches that we should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we should get baptized, and then we should separate from the world. We should come out from the Pharisees. We should come out from what other worldly you know, institutions or whatever that we're part of. We're not to be these secret disciples. And the, the thing that you will see in John chapter 7 with Nicodemus is, is the reason that separation is pushed so much in the Bible is because separation is growth. You cannot grow in the Christian life if you do not separate. If you do not follow 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and come out from among them and be separate, you will not grow in the Christian life. Say, look, let's look at Nicodemus. Look at John chapter 7. So John chapter 3 is the conversation where we presume that Nicodemus got saved. Look at John chapter 7. We see a conversation which with the greater Pharisees and Nicodemus is there. Look at verse number 43 of John chapter 7. If separation, the, the lesson here is if separation never happens, growth will not occur. Look at verse number 43. So there was division, division among the people because of him. Just remember this, too. Jesus did not come to bring everyone together. Jesus came to divide. Jesus came to divide, meaning there is separation that will happen. And there was division here. Even when Jesus you know, came the first time, there was division. Look at verse 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. They were trying to, they were trying to get him arrested and get rid of him um, all the way back in John chapter 7. Then came the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? So they, they told the officers, Go get him. And the officers answered, so here's, here's more of this division. Here's more of this division right here. The officers said, Never, never man spake like this man. The officers went to arrest Jesus, and they're just like, they started listening to him, and they're like, This makes a lot of sense. These miracles, how could this be happening if this wasn't of God? The officers themselves became divided against the very people that they worked for, which was the Pharisees. Then answered them the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? They're just like, you too? He's got more of them. Then they're like, we really got to get rid of this guy. Imagine if you're in this state. I mean, you can't imagine this. But if you're in this state where you literally can't believe Jesus, you're just like, we have to get rid of him. Because all these people are being deceived. Because all these people are just believing him. And Nicodemus himself, many of the Pharisees. But look at verse 48. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them. Look at, look at verse 50. Now Nicodemus chimes in. He that came to, and we know it's the same one, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them. And he defends Jesus. Look what he says in verse 51. I mean, he defends him in like this kind of this, this kind of roundabout way. He doesn't come out and say, I believe Jesus. I'm, I'm one of the rulers that have been, you know, deceived by him. But look what he says. He's like, does our law judge any man before I hear him and knoweth what he do, know, and know what he doeth? So he's saying, maybe we, you should just hear him out. This is, this is Nicodemus. He just kind of throws out this idea like, hey, maybe just don't be so quick to judge. Maybe let's, let's just, you know, hear him out and let him speak. Look what they say. Verse 52, they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. You know what they said to him? They just came out, these masters of Israel. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. These masters of Israel, he says something that could be conceived as defending Jesus, and they come out and they say, what are you from Galilee to? He's like, what are you from where he's from? He's like, go look in the Bible. He's like, there's nothing in the Bible that says any prophet will ever come out of Galilee. I mean, right away, and they're just like very forceful about it. This is why you just have to be very, very careful with self-proclaimed masters of anything. Because just because somebody comes out and says something very forceful and very confident doesn't, have, doesn't mean they have any idea what they're talking about. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Look at verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 1. The Bible says, the Bible literally says that the Messiah will come out of Galilee. <laughs> I mean, the Bible literally says it. Look at verse number 1. Nevertheless, the dimness 
shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. So he's saying he's afflicted these places, but look at verse 3. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Now it's saying these same places that been, have been afflicted, out of those places will come this great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Now go to Matthew chapter 4. This is one of the, it's, it's a literal prophecy of the Messiah. Not just a prophet. It's a literal prophecy saying that the Messiah will go to these places and shine his light in these places that were in this shadow of judgment of God. That's what Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 is saying. And then in verse number 13 of Matthew 4, Jesus literally makes the prophecy come true. Look at verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of where? Zebulon and Naphtali, that, he might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled. You'll always see that. Look, that's why there's so many prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah. So these supposed masters would recognize the Messiah. People today claim to be Jesus, folks. People that are walking on this earth claim to be the Son of God, but they've fulfilled nothing of the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled everything, and he literally did go through these places so he would fulfill this prophecy in Isaiah 9.1 and 9.2, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So when they said this great insult to Nicodemus, were they correct? No, they just said something. They just said something, and it was not true at all. Had Nicodemus, I don't know, been a mature Christian and understood, been a follower of Jesus and been learning the things of Jesus, he could have said, what are you talking about? Look at Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Jesus was just there. He literally fulfilled that prophecy. It's like, not that debating people that, could, you know, that can't believe would help, but the point is it shows the immaturity, it shows the Christian immaturity of Nicodemus. Back to my point, separation is growth. And without separation, there will not be growth. But you know what? The number one reasons that, that reason that Christians even today give for not wanting to separate is, well, I just feel like I can be an influence to, to people. This is, you know, a, a big reason people, Christians are, you know, Christians that want to keep their kids in public school. They're like, well, you know, I think that the Christian kids, the one Christian kid out of 400 that's there, he can be an influence to the other kids at the school. Who did the influencing in this story? Did Nicodemus influence anybody in this story? No, they just, they just came over the top of him with this insult and this untrue statement. Look, there will be no influence. And the reason, first of all, the reason that there will be no influence is because there's no growth. <laughs> so if there's no growth, there's no maturity, and you can't influence anybody. And without separation, you know, there will be no growth. I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about this, this idea of Nicodemus and how he just wanted, he just stayed secret, and he just, you know, he, I mean, that's all you hear about Nicodemus in the Bible, what I just read you. You know, those three places in the Bible is all you hear about Nicodemus. How much do we hear about the disciples in the book of Acts? I mean, it's an entire book in the Bible. The entire New Testament is just talking about the great works of the disciples. But the point is, the first point is, if there's no separation, there's no growth. That's what we see with Nicodemus. I was thinking about this in context of, of people that we see today, and I was thinking about, you know, what I called, like, the, the forever visitor to church. You know, somebody that, that comes to church and, you know, is, well, I was just thinking about people that just, that just don't get into the Christian life. Save people that don't get into the Christian life. And I, and I kind of broke it down to three levels that I've seen. So let me just share those levels with you at first. The first, the first level is this. The first level is somebody that gets saved. They get saved, they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're just not going to do anything. They're just not going to get into the Christian life. They're not going to get into church. They're just, I mean, they're just not going to do it. 
they're just going to, you know, here, you know, here's the YouTube. You know, they're just going to YouTube their Christian life. That, that's what they're going to do. Now, on, on, on YouTube, let me just say this. I, I've changed slightly, but I still feel the same way with this type of, of person that we're talking about here. I mean, YouTube has value. In, in, getting, in getting the gospel out and getting the word of God out to people. But let me tell you something. YouTube is not church. YouTube is not a replacement for church. This is one of the reasons I really have no, like, I have no desire, I have no motivation to, like, rush into getting a live stream going. You, you say, why? Because, like, you should be in church. That's why. Because people should not be live streaming on Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. They should be in church. But this is the first level of people. People that are just going to, they're just going to YouTube this Christian life. They just, they get saved, and they're just going to, I mean, maybe they watch 50 sermons a week. I don't know. But they're just YouTubing this thing. Okay? And that's what they're going to do. And, and they're just, they may get a lot of knowledge. But here's the thing. Knowing and doing are completely different things. You know, you could just be all knowledgeable, and you've listened to every single sermon from every Bible preaching uh, pastor out there, and you just have all this knowledge, but you just are never going to get involved in this Christian life. You're never going to get into church. So that's the first level, all right? The next level is this. People that will be like what I just said, the forever visitor. Now, I considered this. I mean, back in 2016, we went to the Red Hot Preaching Conference, and we went to Verity Baptist Church, and we met the people at that church, and we saw that church, and I, right away, we were, my wife and I were both like, we're in a lot of trouble here because we know that this is where we belong. We know that this is where we belong. We know that this is what we should be doing. We know that we should be in a church. The Bible is very clear about that. We should be out soul winning. We should be out sharing the gospel. It's very clear that we should do that. And, you know, right away I was just like, man, how can I get out of this? Because look, it's a major life change. It's a major life change. You talk about leaving your job, leaving family, Leave, you know, packing everything up and moving. I had a business, I had a career, all these different things. You know, a, a thought entered my mind. A thought entered my mind for, and this thought was in my mind for about 15 seconds. But the thought entered my mind is, you know, one thing I could do where I could, I could keep all these things and I could stay here is I could just, I could put some money aside every year and we could just visit. We could just visit California two or three times a year. And that thought was in my mind for like 15 seconds. Why? Because I realized right away that just visiting people that were sold out, visiting people that were just all in on the Christian life, and you know, visiting people that literally did move across the country to go to a church, I just didn't want to be that guy. And I knew that that wasn't a substitute for what we should be doing. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. So that just wasn't going to fit. But look, you'll see people like that. And look, God bless these people that come and visit two or three times a year. And I'm not trying to beat up on anybody that, that visits a church or, or things like this. But I mean, you will see this person that's just, they're never going to get into church, they, but they're just going to, they're going to be the forever visitor into church. Okay, go to Hebrews chapter 10. But here's really the problem with that. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says, first of all, YouTube is not church. You should be in church. Look at verse 25. Very popular verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, as the matter of a lot of people is. But look at the last part here. It says, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's super important to understand that being in a church and being part of a church, that's where growth will occur. Why? Because the Bible says we're exhorting one another. Well, why didn't Nicodemus leave the Pharisees? He didn't leave the Pharisees because he wanted the praise of men to continue. And he knew that if he left the Pharisees, that that praise of men would turn into chastisement of men. Yeah, he'd have the praise of God and God would be pleased with him. But these men that he was around that were praising him and people, they would now be against him. He would be divided from them. And look, that's a difficult thing to go through. If you separate... And you, if, if you separate and you don't, this is why God gave us church. Because when you separate from that, you need to separate to something. So you can't just separate off to yourself or you're going to have a very difficult time.
Because chastisement and people being against you, it's very difficult to go through by yourself. That's why the Bible here is saying you should be with the assembly, you should be in church, because you'll exhort one another. Meaning, we've all separated from the same thing. We exhort, what do we do? We encourage one another. This is why you, you know, as we, as we go through this Christian life, we act different than everybody else. We, we should act different than everybody else. We look different than everybody else. Look, we look way different than everybody else. I mean, way different. I went to Walmart like two nights ago. I don't go to Walmart very much, but it is ridiculous what people wear today. I mean, it's crazy what people wear today. But look, we're not the only ones that dress appropriately. We're not the only ones that dress uh, girls dress like girls and boys dress like boys. Look, that we're encouraging to one another. Another thing that you'll hear from the forever visitor is, yeah, we, we soul win it. And I thought about this for 10 seconds myself too. We, we go back home and we soul win by ourselves. Yeah, you know, I, I don't believe it. You might go every now and then, but soul winning is something that would be very difficult to do on your own. You know, turn to, uh, turn to Romans. I believe it's Romans chapter, Romans chapter 9. Turn to Romans chapter 9. I mean, basically where the Bible just says, like, how can they preach except they be sent? This is what the Bible is talking about. That verse in Romans is talking directly about, you know, uh, Hebrews 10, 25. Where, look, it's a difficult thing. To go out soul winning by yourself without another group of believers would be very discouraging. Because, look, it's mostly rejection when you think about it. It's mostly people who are not interested when you think about it. But that's why... We must be sent. That's why, you know, there's so, I mean, look, we'll make you a missionary here. You know, people want to be these missionaries that go all across the world. I recently had an email from somebody that went to, like, Afghanistan, and they're like, oh, man, we almost got somebody saved. It's like, are you kidding? We get people saved, like, every week here. We got five people saved yesterday. I mean, it's just, it's, it's very receptive just right here. We'll make you a missionary. But look, it's very discouraging if you were to do that on your own. And that's why people generally... Just don't do it. Romans 10, 15. I'm sorry, I, I left you hanging there. Go to Romans 10, 15. The Bible literally tells us this. In Romans 10, in verse number 15, it says, How shall they preach except they be sent? That's what it means. It's saying you should be sent out by a, by a church, by a group, by an uh, organized you know, group here. Because that is what will keep people going. Because guess what? We exhort each other. You grow. You know? So th that's the second person is, you know, the forever visitor. The people that are, they might pop in. This is why you see, you know, the forever visitor will never have any growth either. And this is why people, that'll, they'll, they'll be the forever visitor. They'll come here. They'll go out soul winning with us. And it's very clear. And look, God bless these people for visiting. That's not what I'm getting down on them about. It's just that, you know, we should go all in on this thing. That's the, that's the design. That's the plan. You know, you'll see people that are the forever visitor. They'll, they'll show up and they'll come soul winning. And you can just see that they're just not experienced. They just don't know. You know, they don't know what to do in, in, in certain scenarios because it takes experience to become a, a good soul winner. I was a silent partner for I can't remember how long before I actually started talking as a soul winner. But even then, over the years of soul winning, you just gain so much experience and you're, you're talking with your brothers and sisters in Christ or I ran into this and I ran into this type of person and, you know, what do we do here? And we have soul winning tips every single week here. We're just teaching specific soul winning lessons. If you see this, you know, all different kinds of scenarios. I think uh, on soul winning lessons, I have over 150 soul winning lessons at this point just on how to be better ambassadors with the gospel. But you know what that is? That's growth. And that growth happens by being with a group of believers. And here's the third, here's the third group of people that I was thinking about that just, they just can't separate and get into a group. It's people that try it. It's people that try it. Maybe they, maybe they do get into a church. And then that growth point happens. They, they run into that growth point where maybe they're, they're it's, it's usually sin. They're usually into some sin. So you have to not only just get in church, but you have to just decide that if it's in the Bible, I'm going to do it. If it's in the Bible and, it, and, it, and it's preached, it, I read it in the Bible, I'm just going to accept it as truth, and that's what I'm going to do. But guess what? Growth, that change in your life, that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. So there's many people that will get into church, and they will hit those growth points, and they will just be like, ah, that's too uncomfortable for me. I'm not going to grow there. 
What did I tell you a couple of weeks ago about being uncomfortable in your life? If you want to do anything great in your life, it, will, it, will, it means you will be uncomfortable. Anything great is going to be difficult. Anything that is going to do great things for the kingdom of God in your life, you're going to have to go through difficulty to get there, to be a great father, to be a great husband, to be a great wife, to be a great mother. You're going to have to go through uncomfortable points. And you know what that is? If you go through those uncomfortable points, if you go through those things, the Bible says it. I'm just going to do it. I'm not used to doing it this way. This, ugh, I'm not used to, you know, treating my husband this way. I'm not used to treating my wife this way. I'm not used to running my household in this way. But if you just do it because the Bible says you do it anyway, that's growth. That's what Christian growth is all about. But that's the third group of people. They'll get into church, they'll hit that growth, and they'll reject the growth. And then they're, they're out of church at that point. But look, that was Nicodemus. Nicodemus is representative of somebody who got saved, and because he did not want to go through all those things, he just, he just stayed where he was at. He just stayed in what? His comfort zone. And he never grew. If he did, it's not in the Bible. He never grew. All the wonderful things in the book of Acts, all the people that are, that are uh, documented throughout secular history as giving their life for Christ, all the disciples who died, were killed for Christ, and just were just awesome witnesses, Hebrews chapter 11 in the Bible, just these people that were just these great testimonies for us to look up to, he was not part of them because he stayed in his comfort zone. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. And you say, so what's the difference between those people and Nicodemus? The, Matthew chapter 4, just look at verse number 20. Never hear anything else about Nicodemus. Yeah, look at all the acts that we are looking at in the book of Acts on Wednesday nights. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 20. Look at the first disciples that Jesus called and look what the Bible says. And it says, and straightway left their nets and followed him. This is the difference. Straightway means right away. He said, follow me. Right away, they're just like, we're done. We're done with this and we're going with you. And that is why they became great. They forsook everything else. And look what they did for the kingdom of God. My wife was telling me about, uh, uh, just uh, I'll end here, but my wife was telling me about yesterday, right before soul winning, she stopped to fill the car with gas, and a guy um, pulled up. You know, she's getting ready to come to the church. We're going to go out soul winning. Um, and a guy pulls up, um, and he's got his truck, and he's got his wife, and I think kids in the car, and, and he's got a boat, and they're heading to the lake. And He's like, this guy was, you know, he's happy, he's talking to his wife and all this. And she just, she had this thought in her mind about, I wonder what this guy would think if he knew where I was going right now. Now, look, there's nothing inherently wrong with, you know, going to the lake or going to do what that guy was going to do. Well, there probably is. But the point is, is that here he's going in this one direction and my wife is going in this other direction. If you would have told him, hey, instead of doing what you're going to do today, you need to come with us and go walk around this neighborhood, you know, and, and knock on people's door with a Bible. Look, he would have thought it was the most bizarre thing in the world, this guy. He would have thought it was the strangest, craziest thing in the world. Just because, first of all, I know that he's probably not saved, but the point is, he's just, he's off in something completely separate from where we are. And this is what Nicodemus chose. He chose to just be separated, literally, from the Christian life and stay with this world of men where the disciples, they just threw away everything else. Look, the only way, the only way to do this Christian life is head first all in. The only way to do it to where it's just joyful for you and, and you just know what you're doing with your life. There's nothing wrong with going, you know, and doing uh, things other than church. That's not what I'm saying. But the only way to do it is to separate from the things that you're supposed to separate from and go head first into this thing. And then you won't have the problems that Nicodemus had. And I mean, look what these guys did for the kingdom of God that just left their nets and followed Jesus. I mean, I can't believe who would choose otherwise. 
So a lot of good lessons learned from Nicodemus' life, um, from the things that he did and the things that he didn't do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.